We'll start our discussion of the uh, countercurrent multiplier by looking at the cellular or the molecular basis of the cells in the thick ascending limb. This information is very important. It has huge clinical and pharmacological significances. For example, in pharmacology, it will explain to you how diuretics can cause diuresis and uh, dilute urine. Clinically, in Barter syndrome, it will explain to you why the symptoms will include salt wasting, volume depletion, and hypokalemia. So here we're looking at the tubule of the thick ascending limb, and you can see in the yellow center that represents the tubular fluid. On the side of the tubule, on the left and the right side, you can see the shaded portions refer to the interstitium. Now, as I told you previously, if you have a countercurrent multiplier, the transport is going to be active. And if you look at the basolateral membrane on the cell on the left and the right side, you will see that on the basolateral membrane, furthest away from the tubular lumen, we have sodium potassium pumps. Now these pumps will uh, are electrogenic and it will pump out more sodium than it will pump sodium, potassium back inside the cell. This is actually the only primary active mechanism. And generally, the transcellular reabsorption of sodium chloride is actually secondary active but all textbooks will refer to the process as being active transport. The sodium potassium pump ensures a very low sodium concentration inside the cells. It also keeps the cells electronegative when it's compared to the tubular fluid or the fluid on the outside. On the apical membrane, that is the side uh, bordering on the uh, tubular um, fluid, there we have a very important transporter. It's referred to as the sodium potassium 2 chloride co transporter. Sodium chloride and potassium and other divalent cations that you find being filtered will now appear in the tubular lumen in the thick ascending limb. There, sodium, potassium, and chloride will be picked up by the co-transporter. To keep everything electroneutral, you'll find that two chloride molecules are taken up for every potassium and sodium molecule. This is a very important uh, transporter, also important because it is blocked by one of the most powerful diuretics that you have, that is namely a loop diuretic, for example, furosemide. Once sodium is inside the cell, it will diffuse to the opposite end of the cell, and at the basolateral membrane, the sodium-potassium pump will pump sodium into the interstitium. Potassium also enters the cell, but that potassium, a very funny thing is happening to it, it is going to be recycled through a channel in the apical membrane, which is referred to as the ROM-K channel. This is a very important process for potassium, because it is the recycling of potassium that's going to keep the sodium potassium 2 uh, chloride co-transporter from being active all the time. The basolateral side of the cells in the thick ascending limb have a very high chloride permeability due to the presence of a number of chloride cells, uh, sorry, chloride channels, for example, CIC. So now you have inside the interstitium sodium and chloride, the salt, you have reabsorbed the salt into the interstitium. So now that we understand the molecular mechanism by means of which the thick ascending limb 
can take up uh, salts and dump it into the interstitium. We also have to turn our attention to the water permeability. There are very few, if any, aquaporins or water channels in the cells of lining the thick ascending limb. Further, the th tight junctions that you find between the cells of the thick ascending limb, they, are, they have a very high resistance and also make it impermeable for water easily flowing from the lumen into the interstitium. So the net result is that the thick ascending limb is impermeable to water, highly permeable to sodium and chloride. Some potassium will also be taken up into the interstitium, but most of the potassium is going to be recycled at the apical membrane. This now leaves as the opportunity of carrying on to the mechanism of a countercurrent multiplier. So we now start with the intricate mechanism of the countercurrent multiplier. This is a mechanism that has provided headaches to many students. But we're going to try and keep it as simple as possible. In my opinion, the best way to approach this mechanism is to divide it into two stages. The first stage can be referred to as the single effect of the countercurrent multiplier, uh, multiplier. Let's look at what happens here on the left hand side. This is a purely hypothetical situation. Let's assume that the glomerulus has filtered and the filtered, which is isosmotic, has now flowed down and up into the loop of Henle and the fluid is purely isotonic. When the fluid reaches the thick ascending limb on the right hand side and gets close to the medulla, this is where we have the uh, pumps and the co-transporters which we have just described. So in the thick ascending limb the mechanisms are going to pick up salt from the thick ascending limb, pump it into the interstitium, and in doing so, they're going to create a gradient, an osmotic gradient. In most mammals, it will be approximately 200 milliosmoles. So this means that the osmolality of the fluid in the ascending limb is going to be less because the thick ascending limb is water impermeable the water is going to stay there and therefore the fluid in the thick ascending limb is going to become hyposmotic the fluid in the medullary interstitium at this level is going to be slightly hyperosmotic so as a result of this osmotic gradient we can have equilibration. Now remember that the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle is impermeable to salts, so salts cannot be used to equilibrate, but it is very water soluble because of all the aquaporins, and water can then escape out of the descending limb and it can equilibrate with the medullary interstitium at this level. So what we are left with over here is a descending limb that is slightly hypertonic at this level, an ascending limb that is slightly hypoosmotic, and an interstitium that is hyperosmotic. That is why the ascending limb is referred to as the diluting limb, as you saw on the graphic representation, and the descending limb is referred to as the concentration limb of the loop. The only problem is, is that this point is that we have not yet multiplied the effect. This only happens at one level.
So, in the next step, we're going to start and explain the multiplication. Let's look at the left-hand side. Now, the left-hand side is exactly a duplication of the previous figure, where we have concentration in the descending limb, concentration in the medullary interstitium, and dilution in the ascending limb. The flow of fluid in the loop of Henley is continuous, which means by mass action, whatever comes down the descending loop of Henley is going to be pushed up the ascending limb. Now, as we can see here, in the previous step, we've made the descending limb slightly hypertonic and the osmolality is 400 milliosmoles per kilogram. This fluid is going to be pushed down the loop and up the ascending loop. The fluid at the level just below the level which we described in the previous figure, there's going to be a space which is then going to be occupied by fluid with an osmolality of 400 milliosmoles. The same thing will happen as previously in the thick ascending limb. The transporters in the thick ascending limb is going to take salt and is going to reabsorb it into the interstitium. Once again, the pump is going to give you a gradient of about 200 milliosmoles, which means that the interstitium is going to become 500 milliosmoles. And then there's going to be equilibration once again from the descending limb. Water is going to flow out. The fluid in the descending limb at this lower level is now going to be 500 milliosmoles. The interstitial fluid at this level in the interstitium is going to be 500 milliosmoles. And the fluid in the thick ascending limb is going to be about 300 milliosmoles. This process is going to be repeated. Remember that when we originally discussed what a countercurrent multiplier is all about, we mentioned the fact that you have a continual pumping of whatever energy you have, for example, heat or whether it is a concentration gradients. So continuing our explanation, the fluid at the level in the descending limb that has an osmolality of 500 milliosmoles will be pushed down by mass action of the flowing fluid. It'll go around the loop of Henle. It'll go up the ascending loop into the thick ascending limb. So now we're going to have a space lower than in the previous uh, figure where a more concentrated fluid, 500 milliosmoles, is going to flow into the thick ascending limb. The same thing is going to happen. The thick ascending limb is going to pump salts out of the limb into the interstitium, once again, establishing a gradient of about 200 milliosmoles per kilogram. The next step we have is we're going to have equilibration of that hyperosmotic medullary interstitium with the descending limb. And now we have a situation where the descending limb has an osmolality at this level of about 600 milliosmoles. We have an interstitium which has an osmolality of 600 uh, uh, milliosmoles and we have the ascending limb which at this level is going to have an osmolality of 400 milliosmoles. So it's just simply a repetition of the single level effect that is going to be repeated over and over again but now each time lower down the loop of Henle where you're working with much higher concentrations.
So I think you can imagine where we're going now. This process, as I said, is going to continue until eventually we're going to have an interstitium that is hyperosmolar. In humans, it can be as high as 1,000, 1,200 milliosmoles. The fluid in the descending limb of the loop of Henley is always going to become more concentrated. The fluid in the ascending limb is going to become more and more hyposmotic. And therefore, the fluid that is going to be pushed eventually into the early distal convoluted tubule is going to be hyposmotic to the environment. So we have a beautiful mechanism here. And if you understand the two steps and you understand the concept, you can imagine what is happening inside the medulla. But we are not finished yet. When the kidney is producing a maximally concentrated urine, it is doubtful that the TAL-driven mechanism alone can produce a medullary interstitium as high as 1,200 milliosmoles per kilogram, possibly only as high as six to 700 milliosmoles. But yet, under high concentrating conditions, osmolality continues to increase in the inner medulla up to the high values of around about 1,000 milliosmoles. The mechanisms for this increase in osmolality remain controversial. Currently, two theories are in favor. Both of these are dependent on passive transport of solutes, quite unlike the active transport in the thick ascending limb. Firstly, there is a role for sodium chloride. The thin ascending limb allows sodium chloride to passively diffuse into the medullary interstitium, but the processes by means of which this happens is not yet known. Secondly, and the most important, we have movement of urea down its concentration gradient into the interstitium, and this adds significantly to the medullary hypertonicity. Some estimates place it as high as 40 to 50 percent. Urea is normally kept within the tubules by a low urea permeability. However, the deep inner medullary collecting ducts are more permeable to urea because of the presence of urea transporters such as the recently cloned AT1A transporter. Urea can then diffuse passively out of the collecting duct and recycle back into the ascending loop of Henle which is passively permeable to urea. While urea is recycling, it becomes trapped in the inner medulla and augments the osmolality of the interstitium greatly, increasing the ability of the nephron to concentrate urine. We have another remarkable fact. Well, ADH is necessary for the maximum concentration of urine. It turns out that the number of urea transporters is increased by the presence of ADH making the collecting duct even more permeable to urea. And under these conditions, maximum levels of urine concentration may be reached. You may well ask, but what other evidence do we have for this role of urea? Well, firstly, the newborn has a poor urine concentrating ability due to the decreased availability of urea at this stage to maintain medullary hypertonicity. Secondly, in adults, renal concentration power is dependent on an adequate protein intake. Protein is the source of urea. Accordingly, urine concentrating ability is reduced when a person is on a low protein diet. I'm ending this discussion by leaving you, those with the inquisitive minds, with one question. How do the cells 
deep in the medulla survive in the hypertonic interstitium? What are the necessary dynamic adaptation mechanisms? I do not know and it is not well understood. Thank you for your attention.